So uh, today we're glad to have Lewis Esser from UCLA, who's going to tell us about varieties general type uh, with doubly exponential asymptotics. Thanks so much for the uh, introduction and for the invitation. Right, so I believe uh, the slides should be available on Discord or somewhere uh, in order that people can see them and follow along if they want to. And yeah, please interrupt me with questions anytime. So first of all, everything I say today will be joint work with Bert Tataro and Chung Chi Wang, who are both at UCLA also. And our story starts with um, trying to understand varieties via their maps to projective space as one is one to do. And for that, you need a line bundle. The most natural line bundle you can produce is the canonical bundle on any smooth projective variety. And a variety of general type, which are gonna be my main objects, are the varieties for which that bundle and its tensor powers give you maybe the most information about X. Okay, so throughout, I'm gonna work over the complex numbers. I'll hopefully indicate why somewhere throughout. And we say that a variety is of general type if when you take the canonical bundle and take a sufficiently high tensor power, I'll use divisor notation and call it LKX here, then the corresponding rational map is birational onto its image. So you see this definition and maybe the first question that comes to mind is how large is sufficiently large? Uh, for a given X, how far do we have to go in order to actually find a birational map like this? And about 15 years ago, there was great progress in this direction. In fact, we have a uniform bound on how large L has to be in every dimension. So this is due to uh, Haken, McKernan, Takayama, and Suji, I believe in three different papers from around the same time. That says, if you fix a dimension, then there's some integer Rn for which after that point, all these maps will become birational onto their images, no matter what X you choose. And from now on, maybe I'll use this letter Rn to denote the smallest integer with this property. So the first number for which everything is birational. And yeah, it's still birational for all subsequent L. So the new question, now that we know this, is how large are these bounds for each N? And maybe you're about to say this, but did they, like their methods, do they give any, did they say anything at all or it's only in existence? Right, so they say very little. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty non-constructive proof in that it sort of partitions varieties into I think volume greater than one and volume less than one. And for the latter case, it just shows that the family is birationally bounded so that they're all birational to varieties of some degree in a, a, in a projective space. But I don't think this says very much about how actually constructing, you know, what these are and are, so. All right, so first thing we might look at is low dimensional examples. Uh, for curves, R1 is equal to three and this is because if you take three times the canonical bundle for any curve of general type, that means genus at least two, then you get a very ample bundle and hence an embedding to projective space. So embedding is a little stronger than we have to be. We only ensure that it's birational onto the image, but embedding is even better. Uh, when you go to dimension two, we have to go up to the fifth pluricanonical map to find something birational. This is due to Bombieri. And the example that forces us to go this far is a particular um, weighted projective hypersurface of degree 10 in P3 with weights 5, 2, 1, and 1. I'll say a great deal more about weighted projective space in a little while. Oh, maybe and, I'll interrupt. I mean, by the dimension one case, you could say that it's only in genes two that you have to go up to three times, you know? So, yeah, so that's, that's true. Only, so yeah. only genus two requires you to go that far, otherwise two times the canonical bundle is sufficient, that's true. And I think also in the surface case, this is the only family of surfaces for which you have to go to the, actually the fifth multiple. For all other families, I think four suffices. Um, okay, and these bounds might be interesting in that they allow you to say something about the construction of the moduli space of curves or surfaces on the other hand, and they tell you sort of how large you have to uh, make your bundle to embed your moduli space in a projective space. So yeah, 
there's these are definitely interesting in that respect. Already in dimension three, we're not completely sure what's going on. We have a lower bound and an upper bound, so some range. And the upper bound is theoretical. It's due to Zheng Kai-chen and Meng Chen. And the lower bound is established by finding just a particularly bad example for which you don't have birational maps until 27 onward. And that example is due to Ayano Fletcher. And it's this particular way to projective hypersurface or it's desingularization. Right, but if you go higher, we actually don't know any upper bounds for this number for n greater than or equal to four, I believe. So yeah, big open question here. So I want to talk about one related measure of these pluricanonical sections before I move on, and that's volume. And we say that the volume of a variety X, this is another measure of the growth of the plurigenera. Um, it's equal to the dimension of the space of sections of LKX divided by LVN over N factorial, and then you take the limb sub of this quantity. Right, so here X has dimension N, and so since it's of general type, we expect that these grow as a polynomial of degree n. And so we're going to get a positive number here. Um, the n factorial has the effect of making volume agree with maybe something more familiar, the top intersection number of kx when kx is nef or better yet ample. And this thing is a birational invariant. So it doesn't matter which model of x we choose to calculate this on. Okay, so you can ask a similar question and it's actually a corollary to the last theorem I mentioned that there is also a uniform lower bound on volume, positive lower bound on volume in each dimension n. And we'll call this constant a n from now on. So r n is the pi-rational maps, a n is the minimum volume in each dimension. And in fact, more precisely, you can show that a n in each dimension is at least one over r n to the nth power. And the way you think about this is that, okay, given an x, r n times the canonical bundle will give you some n dimensional image in projective space. And more or less just considering the sections that come from that image will already bump your volume up to at least this value. But I don't wanna go into more detail maybe there. <laughs> So maybe remind me, Rn was the lower bound on how far you have to go or the upper bound? The well, lower bound. So it's the lowest okay. number for which that map and all subsequent maps are birational onto their images. Yeah. And is there a similar, is there something about the, no, what, is that, what do I mean about this? Like, is there some, some is the volume, is there a, some relation between volumes and the as of yet unknown upper bounds? Like, can you prove prove something the upper bounds by having a lower bound on volumes? Yeah, the, the implication that way is let, I don't know of any way to. to great, okay. So it's at least it's a one way, but not a, it's not. I think so, a, I think so. Yeah, great. thank you. Great, great. All right, so just quickly, let's also review the first few values of these AI. Uh, for curves, it's the same example. Genus two curves have volume two. Volume just means degree for curves of general type, the degree of the canonical bundle, I should say, because uh, they're always ample and intersection number, we're not intersecting anything. So it's just the degree. And for surfaces, we have volume one is the minimum. It has to be an integer because for any surface, you can find a minimal model by rational to it for which the canonical bundle is NEF. And that says we're allowed to use this top intersection number. That always has to be an integer as long as your divisor is Cartier. And okay, yeah, our surface from before has the same extreme property that it has the lowest possible volume. There are other families too that do this, I think. And in dimension three, we have essentially the same sort of bounds. It's in a range where the lower bound this time is due to Zheng Kai-chen and Meng Chen, the same paper. And the upper bound in A3, that means we have volume at least that low is because of an example we know about um, with volume one over 420. Same way to projective hypersurfaces before. 
And I think it's the same story. We don't know anything dimensions four and higher really about this. Okay, so the question I want to consider today Oh, is, sorry, I mean, maybe yeah. I'll just do one interest. Me, my comment on like why why the volume sort of can be not an injury, right? Which is the you know on the middle model or something. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I will talk about this later. Oh, okay. But um, the reason we don't have an integer is, I said for minimal models of surfaces they're smooth. For minimal models of higher dimensional varieties, they're not necessarily smooth. So there's no reason to expect that we can find something birational to X with Neff KX. And there's so there's no interpretation of it. I mean, as I'm sorry, you, you can, but it's just, it's 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 not a cardio divisor, and so that intersection number is not an integer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but it's yeah, not. Okay, sorry, sorry. I think it's yeah. what I said. <clears throat> okay, so the question we want to consider today is, what about with large n? How do these constants behave? So, what are their asymptotics? And there has been some progress in this direction before. A paper from 2013 due to Balco, Pignatelli, and Tassin gives that the Rn increase roughly quadratically in n as n gets large, if it's larger than seven. And let's say maybe the volume is around three over n to the nth power at most, um, or you know that is an upper bound for a n or n greater than or equal to five. And our main theorem for today will be to improve these bounds. In particular, for any n greater than or equal to three, we're gonna establish something doubly exponential in each case. So the Rn's are at least doubly exponential and same thing with the An. Can you remind us of the definition of the An's again? Sure. And, uh, also, yeah. and then um, also, and maybe related to that is you had this, uh, uh, or and related to that uh, is that you had that inequality, which was something like a n times r n was some. I don't know which way the inequality went. Something, and right. then so as that, yeah, a n is the minimum possible volume in dimension n, and the inequality went a n is at least one over r n to the nth power. So that's not okay. So it's not. A n is at least r great. So that's not helping us with either of these. Like it's not that one of these inequalities gives the other than using that inequality. No, what we're going to see right, is okay. both of these come the from finding a particularly pathological example. Um, Excellent, great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Thanks. And yeah, maybe I don't have to convince you that doubly exponential growth is fast, but just <laughs> as an example of this. Um, when we go up to dimension 10, we already need over 3 million times the canonical bundle to find something that's guaranteed to be birational. So uh, this, I guess, speaks to the staggering sort of complexity of varieties of general type as we increase dimension. Um, OK. So one thing you might think when you read that theorem is, how far can you go with this? Can you? sort of keep improving the bounds on these numbers, where do we expect it to stop? And there's at least a little bit of conjectural evidence that doubly exponential is the correct rate of growth or decay for these constants. And I wanna spend a few minutes on why I believe that. Um, it's due partially to this conjecture of Kolar. And the main takeaway of this, there's a lot of notation, which I'll explain is that this is a more general class of varieties than what we're considering. We're doing smooth varieties of general type. Here, we're asking for KLT pairs of general type with certain coefficients. It's definitely a, um, a more general question. And Kolar proposes the minimum possible volume in this case, meaning the volume of KX plus delta instead of KX, but you use the same formula. And I'll, yeah, let me put some of the notation on here. Uh, we say that a pair is of general type this time if kx plus delta has the same property that kx had before could be q cartier instead of cartier because we're not dealing with smooth varieties anymore but that's okay um, these h's are general hyperplanes in pn and uh, you know it's worth saying pn is as far away as you can be from general type but if you add on all these hyperplanes you'll get a divisor that's very very slightly positive a positive multiple of a o of one. And so this is still a pair of general type. 
Um, okay, sorry for all the terminology here. Standard coefficients means that everything I see here is of the form one minus one over an integer, which you can see all the coefficients match that description. And finally, these S's um, are Sylvester's sequence, which begins with two, and each subsequent one is the product of all the previous ones plus one. Um, Sylvester's sequence will come back, and that's one reason why I mention it here. Okay, so why is this a natural problem to consider maybe? I'll, yeah. Well, I, well I, actually, let me, let me ask. So, so sure. it, with this conjecture, this is suggesting that your result is, is sort of roughly optimal, like you've got the optimal rate of growth. So then I have to ask, and I'm guessing the, I'm guessing the answer is gonna be a good one, that he made this conjecture before your example, because otherwise it's much, much less. If you made yes, the conjecture yes. after uh, your so example- So this was from, a, yeah, several years ago. Okay, um, okay. Well, several years ago meaning before your, okay, good. That, yeah, that means, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before before we did this, yeah, this is already a conjecture. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Okay. So maybe the first thing I want to say is why these pairs are natural. Uh, just quickly, they arise because you look at um, quotients of a variety of general type by some group of automorphisms, and those will be pairs of general type with these coefficients, the coefficients of the type that I mentioned. Um, so, right, we choose delta so that the pullback of kx plus delta is ky when you take this quotient. And um, delta is measuring ramification of this quotient. In particular, I guess, by the Hurwitz formula, you expect if the ramification index is e to have something of multiplicity e minus one showing up in the canonical bundle upstairs. And if you look at sort of its image downstairs, you have to divide by e. And so you get e minus one over e as your coefficient. So sorry, that was kind of sketchy, but that's the idea. And right, as Ravi said, the theorem plus, if we assume the conjecture, would say that the minimum volume bound is at least is roughly between these two numbers, more or less. It's doubly exponential of some sort, at least. However, uh, this is just conjectural. The conjecture is actually only known for dimension one, so maybe this isn't all that convincing. And it's worth mentioning maybe in dimension one, the volume in question is one over 42. And that number comes from taking a curve of general type with the maximal number of possible automorphisms. That's 84 times G minus one. And then you divide the degree of that, the canonical bundle on that curve, which is two G minus one. And by that, and you get one over 42. So that's where this number comes from. And these are called Hurwitz overfolds for that reason. Okay, so any questions about this, maybe before I move on? So is, is uh, so Kolar's example, you described it as P and, and some hyperplanes with coefficients. So right. is what you said that there is a, like a branch cover, like an abelian branch cover, productive space branched over the hyperplane. So it's like if the coordinates are X, one, X naught through Xn, it's like Y naught to the Sylvester number to the, to like Y naught squared is X naught, Y one cubed is X. Yeah, I think that's one. right. So, and that thing I, is a general type thing and it's got no pair and all the pairness is gone. Like it just, that guy's just honestly general type and it doesn't give an example. It doesn't scoop your theorem because it's not, ooh, you know what? yeah, but it's up for some reason, it's not an example of your, it's not, it's not an example of what you're trying to build. Right. My question. So, yeah. I mean, I mean something thing, the quotient we get is in general type. So, I mean, um, right. Okay. That, that's, that's one thing. And I, I was also going to mention that maybe this is on the next slide, but we can view Kolar's example as kind of a special example of the type we're considering where we, we drop one of our restrictions. Um, like if you, we're going to be considering way to project to spaces in a second. And if you allow um, quotients by group actions that are not free in co-dimension one, then you get this ramification. And I think you can actually think of the example on the last slide as coming from that. Um, but yeah, let me, let me put something on the, on the screen. Great. Okay, so the second part of the talk is gonna be about weighted projective hypersurfaces and how we study them. 
yeah, so first the intro, same setup as ordinary projective space. We have affine space minus the origin modulo some multiplicative group action, except it's not acting by the same power of T in every coordinate. We are allowed to have different powers showing up. And right, this is what I was talking about. Um, we assert throughout the talk from now on that these things are well formed in the sense that if you remove any one weight, the GCD is one. And this is ensuring that there are no non-trivial stabilizers in co-dimension one. Um, you could sort of drop this assumption and consider other examples, but um, then we would have some ramification showing up. And I think at least vaguely you get back to the situation uh, in the conjecture. <laughs> so yeah, let, let me just say that. All right, so a couple of things. Uh, these are rational varieties, so they're not going to be our candidates, but hypersurfaces inside them will be. And they're not smooth necessarily, but they have pretty mild singularities, only cyclic quotient ones. So not so bad to control. Oh, right. And one more thing is that just like ordinary projective space for any integer, you have a reflexive sheaf on your space. It's not necessarily a line bundle unless all weights divide this integer D. But nevertheless, you can think of it as analogous to O of one, et cetera, on projective space. And yeah, first two examples you should meet are ordinary PN when all weights are one. And the first singular example is the cone over a conic, which is when you make P112. Uh, the coordinate point of that coordinate two will be the, the cone point. All right. Um, so we're going to consider hypersurfaces inside that. But we want them to be just as nice to study as ordinary weighted projective space. And so we're going to place a restriction on what hypersurfaces arise by only looking at quasi smooth ones. And so let me explain this terminology. You take a weighted projective, sorry, a weighted degree D polynomial, and that cuts out your hypersurface. But you could also look upstairs in affine space and say, okay, what is the um, zero locus of the polynomial up there? And we say that the hypersurface is quasi smooth if that affine cone is smooth as long as you're away from the origin. And right, so I have a little picture. The picture is showing you that on the left, we have our affine cone. It's not literally a cone maybe because the fibers aren't straight lines, but uh, it looks sort of like a cone. And the image after you take the quotient, our hypersurface X, it might be singular, but it's only singular where Y is singular. And the singularities are also cyclic quotient singularities. So it's about as nice as you can expect given that we're working inside weighted projective space. So uh, I think the next few things are just saying what I'm saying. Quasi-smooth hypersurfaces have only cyclic quotient singularities. And also we know the adjunction formula holds for them. Um, so we can calculate what Kx is. It's the degree minus the sum of the weights. Just like an ordinary projective space, it would be D minus the sum of the weights one, which is N plus one. Okay. So we need to understand when hypersurfaces are quasi-smooth. In ordinary projective space, things are nice. You can just take general degree D things and they're smooth, but we have to be a little bit more careful in weighted projective space. Uh, the reason vaguely is because there aren't always enough monomials to create a general polynomial that has enough degrees of freedom. And I, I wanna make this precise with the following proposition. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but we'll have an easy case to consider that should be the one you think about. Um, we say that, or we can prove that um, a general hypersurface is quasi-smooth only if one of these two conditions holds. One of them is that a weight equals a degree, but I'm going to ignore that one. We're not going to consider it the rest of the talk, so feel free to ignore point one. And in point two, we have to consider every possible subset of the weights, and those must all satisfy either A or B. Okay, so one of them is that D is an n-linear combination, or there's this weird condition where you find things outside your subset such that when you subtract off the corresponding weight, then it's an n-linear combination. I'll try to indicate briefly why that is. But first of all, the easy case. 
um, if all the weights divide the degree, we're good. 2A is satisfied for any subset of weights. So that's the case you should think about. And also um, all our examples have nearly every weight divide the degree. Maybe one or two don't, but we don't have to worry about this too much. If you guys say a small thing. So, I mean, I don't know if you said this, but there's some other polynomial rings that's relevant for your projective spaces, a polynomial ring where the generators have different degrees, these AIs. And, and so that's why there just might not be that many polynomials of a certain degree. Too, right? so. Yeah, thank you. So these are weighted degrees. So yeah, if, if D is some random number that the AIs don't divide, you won't expect that many monomials, right? Uh, maybe a little taste of what's going on here. Uh, these I's, these subsets, you should think of them as corresponding to basically the coordinate strata of weighted projective space. And we're checking whether a certain stratum, maybe upstairs in the affine cone, is in the base locus of your linear system of all polynomials of degree D or not. Um, so that case A is saying that there's at least one monomial that's not identically zero on the stratum we're interested in. And so you can use some Bertini-like argument to, I think literally Bertini's theorem will show you that uh, the general one is smooth there. In part B, I'm gonna skip the details, but you allow yourself to be in the base locus, but there's still gonna be enough partial derivatives that are non-zero that you get something smooth. Um, so, right, that's, that's why you subtract off this AJ. It's like taking the derivative to get rid of one variable and then what's left should be non-zero most of the time. So a little bit of an aside, we've been considering pretty singular varieties, whereas we want to consider smooth ones to prove the main theorem. And yeah, to make that connection, I should mention the class of singularities that we'll be interested in using. Um, those are canonical or terminal. And if, yeah, X is canonical or terminal, if it has discrepancies that satisfy this inequality. So we need KX to be Q Cartier, and when we take a resolution, the discrepancies of each exceptional divisor are either non-negative or positive. Um, one reason that these singularity classes are interesting, I'm going to state things for general type varieties where they're easier. But if we run the minimal model program, then you start with your smooth model where we know KX is at least big. That's what general type means. You can find a model with KX nef at the cost of terminal singularities and KX is no longer Cartier, as I mentioned earlier, necessarily. And also um, you can make KX ample at the cost of introducing canonical singularities. Um, so all of the weighted projective hypersurface examples we see will be the canonical models of something smooth. And those smooth varieties are really the subjects of the theorem that we're talking about. So the point here is no matter which model you use, it doesn't affect the plurigenera, it doesn't affect the volume, it doesn't affect really anything that we're interested in. So you can study the singular model, take a desingularization, it will still have all the nice properties you want. All right. So I guess that leads you to wanting to know when are cyclic quotient singularities canonical or terminal? And so I need to tell you how to find the answer to that. Sorry for additional notation, but just briefly so I can state it correctly. Um, a cyclic quotient singularity is more or less what we've seen before. We're gonna take an affine space, quotient it by a finite group of cyclic of order R, and we're using this same sort of action with weights. And we can say whether those things are canonical or terminal using this theorem due to read. Um, okay, so you also have to assume that this singularity is well-formed. You should think of this as analogous to the condition that our projective space is well-formed in that you're trying not to have co-dimension one stabilizers. And then we have this maybe strange looking condition that we want the weights, you multiply them by some number i, you take each of them modulo r, that will give you a remainder, between zero and R minus one, you add those things up and then you want that to be at least R. Okay, so some combinatorial condition. And I should mention here that 
it's relatively easy to read off the singularity type of a wage projective space or a hypersurface once you know the weights. So we'll be able to apply this criterion without too much trouble. But rather than tell you the details, I just wanted to give an example of how this all works before we move on. So here's a picture of a particular space. Um, this is a hypersurface of degree 20 in P10411. And so the hypersurface is going to be dimension two. On the left, I'm looking at the ambient weighted projective space and showing you where it has singularities. It has singularities at the coordinate points where um, the weights aren't one, for one thing. And yeah, let's take a look at that top point. The way you find the singularity type is you take one over the weight, and then the other weights of the projective space become the weights of that singularity. And you'll notice that um, that's actually not canonical because four plus one plus one is less than 10. So this is an example of how you'd apply the retag criterion. Um, on the lower left, you have another coordinate point, which is not smooth. Here I've reduced 10 to two modulo four, but otherwise the same rule I said applies. That point is canonical. And these aren't isolated either. There's a one dimensional stratum connecting them, every point of which is singular. And you can find the singularity type there by taking the GCD of 10 and four. And then those two ones are still hanging around as weights for your um, quotient singularity. So actually type one, one, one half, one, one is an ordinary double point um, of a surface, I think. So yeah, that's the picture on the left. And then on the right, you introduce a hypersurface. Uh, 20 is divisible by 10 and four. So if I wiggle around my hypersurface enough, it'll avoid the coordinate points. And in particular, it avoids the non-canonical coordinate point. So just because the ambient space wasn't canonical doesn't mean the hypersurface isn't. Um, in fact, the hypersurface is. It just has one ordinary double point that it inherited from intersecting the one-dimensional stratum. Okay, so this is how you would take a particular hypersurface and study it. Any questions about yeah this diagram? So yeah, hopefully that makes things a bit more concrete. So a summary of where we are. Uh, we're about to get to the main results and how we prove them. What we've managed to do is take a general hypersurface of degree D and some weights and reduce all the questions we want to know to study you know, calculations involving these numbers. Uh, we can answer whether X is quasi-smooth. And if yes, does it have canonical or terminal singularities? What is KX? We'll want to study the case of KX equals OX1, because that's sort of the smallest possible positive divisor that will give you something of general type. And you can also read off the volume in this case where KX is OX1. It's the degree divided by the product of the weights. This you can calculate, I think, just with plain old intersection numbers since KX is ample. I mean, yeah, KX would be ample on this variety, although you have to take a multiple of it to get a line bundle. And yeah, we can also say something about what Rn would be sort of in this situation, what a bound on Rn would be, because you know that if Kx is Ox1, there's no possibility of the pluricanonical maps seeing all the polynomial generators until L is at least the maximum number of the weights. Okay, so the reason being, if you're below that, your LKX doesn't even know about one of the generators of the polynomial ring that gives you your variety when you take the project of it. And so you couldn't possibly have an image up to that dimension. So yeah, maybe you could do better than this, but this is maybe a, a simple bound you can establish. Okay, so yeah, summary is that we have some calculations on numbers that give us all the information we want to know. And so we're left with maybe a pretty difficult optimization problem where we have all these constraints we want to satisfy and you want to find the lowest volume and the highest weights, more or less. And I just wanted to give a little timeline of how we've grappled with this. Um, so for some context, there've been a couple of papers this year related to the question. And um, 
the first one due to Taro and Wang was to choose weights to be products of some consecutive integers and their subsets. And we established, you know, they established some volume bound using that. Um, all, all the papers I'll mention have other results of interest too, but just to show how this has progressed over the summer, um, maybe another try is to choose weights as products of some of the first K primes to ensure, you know, we have this well formedness thing where they're all going to be relatively prime at the end. And um, yeah, so Terry Tao joined our project for that because um, it turned out to provoke sort of an analysis question on how to bound a certain sum of dilated sawtooth functions, it turns out. So that was to optimize this constant that appears in the exponent from a lower number to 0.99 or something below one. But anyway, there, I'm just trying to emphasize there are a lot of different ways you might think to work on this problem. And then, yeah, most recently we established this doubly exponential bound somehow. I'm gonna tell you how now. All right, um, maybe the key insight is that it's useful to consider varieties other than general type. Um, and those other, yeah, hyperservices that aren't just of that sort. And um, I'm gonna look at Calabi-Yau examples for a little while. We'll see how this connects back right at the end. And for me, kalabi will mean um, Kx is Q linear equivalent to zero. Yeah, so we'll see how these actually lead to examples of general type. Um, but yeah, uh, the other papers had also studied different types of varieties, but yeah, we, we have to connect them together somehow. And the reason kalabi are nice is because we eliminate one of the constraints that we are worried about. Uh, in the sense that if you have a quasi-smooth hypersurface with the degree equal to the sum of the weights, canonical singularities are automatic and we don't have to worry about satisfying the read tag criterion. So this will be a big break because then we can just worry about quasi-smoothness and that's a lot easier to treat on its own. Okay, so yeah, why is this true? Here's the proof. Um, Kx is Ox because of this adjunction formula when the degree is the sum of the weights. And so if I take a desingularization, the discrepancies will be integers. In this equation, KW is Cartier. So the right-hand side is Cartier and each BJ is an integer. And furthermore, um, all the examples we consider are KLT because they only have cyclic quotient singularities. And if you're an integer greater than negative one, which is what KLT ensures, then you must be at least zero. So, I don't know, kind of a nice trick that allows you to get singul singularities of a nice type for free here. Okay, so what does this allow us to do? We're going to construct all our examples using Sylvester sequence. So here's the return of Sylvester sequence, and that will reveal sort of why they're doubly exponential. Um, just to remind you the first few terms, remember we start with two, and then each one after that is the product of all the previous plus one. Um, so by construction, these things are all relatively prime. They suit our purpose as well to find something well-formed in the end. And they grow doubly exponentially. Each is about the square of the previous one, roughly. And we have this bound compared to two to the two to the m. And uh, another really cool thing about these is that when you sum up their reciprocals, you get one minus one over the product. Um, and this will allow you to write down a set of weights that adds up to the degree quite easily. All right, so another sort of bonus here is that this is the best possible way to sum to one using reciprocals in some precise way in that the series of these reciprocals converges more quickly than any other possible. Sequence. Is it really that it, it's that recent? It sounds argument that recently that that's that's amazing that it converges. Yeah, I, I, mean, I kind uh, of I kind of assumed that was true and like known for centuries, but uh, that's really cool. Yeah, this is the only reference I know of, so I I guess I guess not. Yeah, but I mean th this is a really nice sequence for our purposes because these properties lead directly to 
maybe one of the best possible examples that you could you could write down. Um, so if we restrict ourselves to waste dividing the degree, which doesn't have to be true, but that's the easy case where you know things are nice, um, then you might be partially convinced at least that this is the best possible example. Um, because if you make the degree the product, then we can uh, remove one term of Sylvester sequence in each weight, you know, divide by it. And the sum of these weights will be D because of that nice reciprocal formula. It's well formed because every, all of these things will be um, relatively prime if you put them all together. And it automatically has canonical singularities because it's Claudia. Um, so since this is the best sequence of reciprocals you could find, you might expect this has the highest weights of any example like this you could write down. So, and, right, now I'm, I'm, so right now I'm feeling very, I mean, this is great, but I'm feeling sad because it's Glabiao and you just gave away the game by, I mean, like that's, okay, so now, <laughs> this is great. So, so I know a twist has got to be coming or else maybe you're just going to, yeah so be, be sad and then the talk early and just say uh, yeah i promise by the end i'll i'll connect it back to where we started <laughs> but you know the one of the points of this is that the related questions for clavios are also of interest um so yeah on this next slide um, what if we ask analogous questions to what i started the talk with but for clavio varieties since we already have an example at hand maybe let's answer those first um, yeah, what we can say about this is that kx is zero, we can't talk about volume of kx anymore, but okay, maybe we take a canonical Calabiao, you take some ample V divisor on it, what is the volume of that in the sense that, you know, you take large enough multiples to be Cartier, you take the sections of those and you do the same volume calculation. Um, and we get something doubly exponential too in this case. But uh, better yet, maybe we can actually tell you what the best one is conjecturally. And it's a small modification of the key example on the last slide, just like all the rest of the examples will be. The difference maybe is that um, one of the weights, that smallest one, Sn minus two, doesn't divide the degree. So you have to check something with the quasi-smooth criterion. But yeah, it's not meaningfully different. And we conjecture that this is the canonical Calabiao n-fold that has the smallest possible volume of an ample Bay divisor in dimension n. And right, it's definitely reasonable to ask, uh, why is this a question that makes sense? Why is there even a positive minimum? And yeah, this was recently shown by Bierkar that um, pairs of this type have bounded volume in each dimension. Okay. So let's see a couple examples of this family. Uh, in dimension one, we have degree six in P2321. And this is an elliptic curve embedded in Praj of the section ring where you take multiples of the origin. So you look at basically the, the generators and relations that arise as you take multiples of P and look at their sections. And um, this is closely related to the Weierstrass equation for an elliptic curve. And yeah, that's our example in dimension one. Um, in dimension two, you get a K3 surface, a canonical K3 surface. Um, and the volume is one over 330, which is known to be the lowest for all K3 surfaces and ample bay divisors on them. So yeah, there's some evidence for the, yeah. Go ahead. Let me ask. Uh, so the so these examples, like you're choosing a general hypersurface in a family, but it sounds like in the so in higher dimensions, there's not going to be just one. But you're saying that I guess in low dimension, are you saying there's only one case? Like I have to. Like so, sorry. Yeah, I is. should say maybe I should the, say yeah. The, this family. There's a bunch of them. The minimal okay. family. Thank you. That's a good point. Great. Um, Great. And then the and then the elliptic curve. That elliptic curve. That particular one is an example of a club right you want a clavial with a veda divisor but then you could deform it to take another elliptic curve with the same veda divisor right am i not mistaken or are you taking yeah, i think uh, that i think that's also true so, um, so somehow you have another example that's got the same numerics but right with the new numerics that didn't come up 
in the way that you described, that that was not of the form you described, which is slightly, I don't know, it's no contradiction, but it's slightly somehow alarming because it's, I, I would kind of expect that. I think every elliptic curve can be embedded this way in weighted projective space. Uh, Oh, this is not the, oh, I would write it wrong. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. I thought you got a particular elliptic curve, one with the, with-, uh, with Sorry, the, yeah, whenever I am talking about this, I'm talking about general, an optimal family, other. not an optimal, maybe specific variety. Okay, yeah. I misunderstood. I should have clarified it's not that. that. Yes, thanks, great. Thanks. Sorry, I misunderstood. Right, likewise, um, the next two are um, maybe not as compelling evidence, but we do at least know you know you, these numbers get very big very fast um but these next two examples are at least known to be the smallest volume for a family of general weighted protective hypersurfaces in that given dimension um, and this is due to basically a, a guided computer search that really enumerated all of these possibilities um, of a couple years ago okay so there's some reason to believe that yeah these are fitting into an optimal family And let's see. Right. Um, since in low dimensions, weighted projective hypersurfaces have often been the best examples, it's not unreasonable to expect that maybe they'll continue to do so uh, as we increase dimension. Okay. So, one last detour uh, before we get back to the main theorem was that, yeah, we can play this game for Fano varieties too, just to mention it. And there's really nothing extra here, I promise. We're just taking the previous family or previous example, and we're adding on a weight one at the end. And what that does is it bumps you up one dimension and it reduces kx to from ox to ox minus one, which is now going to correspond to something Fano. Um, so, yeah, really the same thing. But Nevertheless, there's at least some reason to believe that this also is optimal in that it's the terminal Fano n-fold with minimal anti-canonical volume in this case. Again, doubly exponential. This is a bounded problem as well due to a different paper of Birkar, which talks about a boundedness of anti-canonical families. Okay. And right, I can repeat the same couple of examples just to mention a little bit of how they work. Um, the first one goes from dimension one to two, and now it's a smooth Del Pezzo surface of degree one, embedded using its anti-canonical ring. And this volume has to be an integer because terminal surfaces are smooth. So um, that's why we have the bound of one in this case. And yeah, the next one also was known previously to be of lowest anti-canonical volume for terminal threefolds of phonotype. And so, yeah, that, that's good evidence. In dimension four, we don't know for all things of that dimension, but we do know something by the same sort of computer search that it's going to be the best you can do for hypersurfaces in weighted projective space. OK, so I promised you a. A return so, to general type, yeah. But go ahead. So, so maybe I've uh, so those examples you gave, I, I soon have lost. So I was hoping to see eighteen oh sevens and things like that in there, or whatever the uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I don't see them, but the I don't. I, but those are so that's your sequences don't seem to be. I, I just wasn't paying attention to what massaging you did, and I guess the right. They they are so. there. They're just hidden because we okay. have the degree is oh divide oh there it is, is okay. yeah whatever this by. thing is instead of. Um, Okay, good. No need to tell me more. I get it. I, that's where they are. So, they, but, yeah, but did you realize? Did you realize they were there? I mean, so those examples were known before, and maybe in retrospect, it's obviously there. But you know, obviously, it wasn't obvious to me. It, it <laughs> didn't seem numbers. to be noticed that all of these first few were related to, to Sylvester okay. sequence. Um, that's great. But after the fact, it became yeah, that's neat. Yeah. Great. But yeah, every single example I mentioned is built out of Sylvester sequence. Thanks. OK, so yeah, general type. Let's, let's return back to where we started. Um, the method we used to produce examples of general type was to, here, here's how it works. You start with that key Calabiao example, simplest possible one you could think of, where the degree is the product of Sylvester sequence, 
you would really have your 1807 show up here. Um, and then you double all the weights. This notation means the weights are repeat, repeated twice. Sorry, yeah, repeated twice, not literally doubled. We do double the degree, however. And what you get after that will be something that's clobby out in terminal. Um, the reason we upgrade is because in the read tie criterion, we've doubled the sums that appear. So they're now bigger than R necessarily. And yeah, we, do, we just take off a one. And when you take off a one, you go from KX is OX to KX equals OX one, and you're back in the world of general type. And yeah, you can prove without too much difficulty that this is still canonical using the read tie criterion, because you still have all the weights you need from the original example to contribute to that sum and bring you up to R. In fact, you can actually show this as terminal as well, but um, yeah, it's definitely canonical. And this will give you at least in odd, odd dimensions, the example you want, because we've now have twice as many weights as we did before. Okay, and you can do something similar for even numbers. I'm just gonna put them on screen so you can see. Um, for every dimension, at least four. If you're odd, we use the example on the last slide. If you're even, we use a very similar example. It still has some doubling of weights. Maybe you fool around with the lowest ones a little bit. And the degree is now a couple Sylvester sequence terms multiplied together. But either way, um, we can desingularize it, get something smooth with volume less than one over two to the two to the n over two. That's the explanation for this n over two business is because we've doubled weights. And um, yeah, the Rn for this dimension will have to be at least doubly exponential too, because the highest weight here increases doubly exponentially with dimension. All right, so this will justify the main theorem on smooth varieties of general time. All right, yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, Gonna unmute ourselves and thank Lewis for a great talk and a great result.